1968, my family moved from the city to a new house on a rural dirt road in Heinsburg, Vermont. I was nine. There were no other kids for a few miles except my older brother, Woody, who I fought with more often than not. Our TV only got three channels, and one was in Quebecois French. And my mother always insisted that we get out of the house and go outside and play, or fight, as the case may be, until dinner. So on weekends, we hung out at the Morse's house, helping out with whatever project or chore came up. Jim and Margaret Morse were a late 20-something couple from suburban New Jersey who decided to live out their Green Acres fantasy by buying the old house and acreage across the road from ours, and turning it into a small hobby farm. Over a period of a couple years, Jim and Margaret got chickens, a, ca a few calves, pigs, and a goose named Lumley, who is a far more vicious guard dog than any of the sickly and short-lived mutts Margaret would serially adopt from the county shelter. Margaret loved to bake and sometimes put me to work in the kitchen. I learned the fundamentals of baking bread and the art of canning fruit, jams, and vegetables. She taught me weights and measures before we covered them in fifth grade. A pint's a pound, the world around. Two tablespoons an ounce will make. Eight ounces a cup, whether you drink or bake. <laughs> she was also a high school science teacher, so she explained yeast and why sterilizing canning jars was necessary and how pressure cookers worked. Margaret's, Margaret's husband, Jim, was an environmental biologist by trade who worked for the state. But at home, he fashioned himself as a master builder. Woody and I picked up basic figure-it-out-as-you-go carpentry, <laughs> foregoing any concept of craft with Jim and his equally unskilled volunteer friends. <laughs> we helped build a chicken coop, a large storage shed, fences, and a pigsty. I learned about studs and rafters, that level is always better than square, and that the amazing versatility of both the home light chainsaw and the word fuck. When not building something, we were put to work in the garden that produced zucchinis the size of Ottomans. <laughs> For some reason, Woody and I always got along when we were at the Morses. But not all aspects of idyllic farm life were pleasant. The first indication of this was the two calves taken away, returning later as a couple dozen packets of veal <laughs> in the huge freezer in the Morses' mudroom. The third calf avoided the fate of the other two. We named him Roger. <laughs> he was friendly and he would come over to the fence if you called him for a scratch behind the ear. But one weekend, the Brown brothers from the dairy farm down the road came over. <laughs> Craig and Gary Brown were much bigger than the average high school kid. <laughs> they were the volunteer muscle Jim could recruit with the lure of underage beer drinking. The four of us went out to where Roger was penned up. Craig held down the calf while Gary instructed Jim on how to cut out Roger's testicles, how to pinch the incision closed and ap apply the brown antiseptic salve. I was at Roger's head, not doing much holding, but assigned the task of keeping him calm. <laughs> Roger's panicked eye stared straight into mine as if to say, hey, hey, I thought we were friends. After this episode, Roger wasn't that friendly. <laughs> a month later, the Morses got another young calf, Ralph, who went through the same ritual castration as his initiation to steerdom. Roger and Ralph grew up to the ripe old age of two before getting sent off to be steaks, roast, and burger packets, a large portion of which was added to the mudroom freezer. In the fall, once the 40 chicks had grown and those identifying as hens began laying eggs, it was time to thin the flock by harvesting the young and sadly useless males. <laughs> it became obvious to me at a young age that if you reincarnate as, far, as a farm animal, it's best to be female. <laughs> Woody and I took turns climbing into the chicken coop to grab the next contestant and bring it over to Jim, where he somehow determined its sex. Hens were splotched with a magic marker and returned to the coop for a life of egg-laying servitude. But once the unlucky male was outed, our job was to hold him down on the chopping block, and as Jim pulled his head before lopping it off with an axe. By the third chicken, Woody discovered that if you immediately let the headless chicken go, it runs away. 
blood pulsating out of its neck and everything. So uh, after picking up a few dis decent first down yards, the scrambling chicken would slow to a wobble before collapsing, sometimes still flapping a wing or moving his feet for another few seconds. Margaret had an entire explanation for how a chicken's nervous system could do this without a brain, but we didn't care. Woody and I just turned this whole headless chicken thing into a competition to see whose chicken could run the furthest. <laughs> Woody won. He had a brown one that made it about 40 feet. Might have gone further if it hadn't slammed into the garden fence. <laughs> Dead chickens were brought back to Margaret where she attached a bent-up wire hanger to its feet before dropping it into a cauldron of boiling water. And after a minute, she hung the bird up from a hook and we began pulling steaming wet feathers off. Once plucked naked, Margaret sliced a four-inch hole between the legs through which you could insert your hand and remove the warm guts with a single yank. Margaret turned gutting into a biology lesson as well. We were shown the heart, liver, craw, and gizzard of each chicken. I'm still not sure what a gizzard does. <laughs> Together we hacked and packed over two dozen chickens that day to join the veal in the freezer. Headless chickens and eventually headless people began making regular appearances in my preteen nightmares. <laughs> I was much more tormented by an irrational fear of decapitation than one would expect with an <laughs> otherwise normal 10-year-old boy. But to this day, if I see a raw piece of poultry with excessive feather stubble on it, I remember that day of the headless chicken track meat the nauseating smell of wet feathers and the feel of warm bird guts. Drink. When Jim brought home the three piglets, they were the size of footballs. We fed them with a giant baby bottle for the first few weeks and they grew fast. We named them Larry Moe and Curly, <laughs> even though Curly was female. Margaret lobbied for Peter, Paul, and Mary, but Jim wisely sided with the Three Stooges campaign. <laughs> the sty we built was neither square nor level. It was about 20 by 20 feet and built with two by sixes and sheep wire with a partially enclosed corner covered with corrugated roofing tin to make a suitable sleeping area. Stooges always perked up when anybody approached, mostly because they assumed you were going to, get, um, going to feed them. Pigs, as you might expect, are all about food. Their sty soon became an aromatic melange of mud, shit, hay, and whatever inadvertently they flung out of the trough. Corn stalks, bad veggies from the garden, crab apples collected beneath the tr from beneath the trees along the road, or various items from Morse's pig-worthy kitchen garbage. In September, when school started, Jim hired me to feed the Stooges in the morning for $3 a week since he and Margaret both left early for work. Woody turned down the job. Not a morning person, he wanted nothing to do with it. The pig breakfast was a bucket of brown slop mixed from what appeared to be freeze-dried vomit and water with the, cons and with the consistency of runny oatmeal. It didn't matter. Stooges loved it. And they were thrilled to see me each morning at 6 a.m., grunting enthusiastically and taking a few celebratory laps around the sty in parade formation. When the Stooges were about a year old or so, every other Thursday, Margaret drove over to a grocery warehouse in Williston to pick up a pile of discarded snack food, little individually wrapped cupcakes and cookies and pastries well beyond the sell-by date. After she backed the truck up to the sty, Woody and I sat in the back unwrapping the goodies and tossing them into or kind of near the trough, occasionally pausing to snack on one or two ourselves. <laughs> Mo even got so he could catch the snacks in his mouth if your aim was good enough. He was clearly the athletic one. <laughs> when I walked up to the trough in the morning with slop, they got excited. But when Margaret backed up the truck on old pastry day, they went apeshit. <laughs> running around squealing in sheer joy. And if Jim ever backed up the truck on another day to drop off hay or feed in the nearby storage shed, they would start their snack party ritual, but after a few minutes realize, oh, it's a false alarm, and then just calm down. He'd either go back and huddle into the corner of the sty or decide to root around in the muck for leftovers since, you know, they were up anyway. This Thursday evening pastry orgy went on through the summer until the end of October. The day had come to slaughter the Stooges. 
one for the freezer and two to cover butcher, butchering cost and make a little profit. I guess I always knew they would get turned into bacon, hams, and pork chops one day, but now it was a grim reality. So that Saturday's chore started with putting the wooden sideboards on the old truck and figuring out how to force Larry Moe and Curly each at about 200 pounds into the back. This again required the 12-pack entice volunteer muscle <laughs> and general farming know-how of the Brown brothers. Woody and I would be relegated to non-contact support roles. Once the sideboards were on, Jim slowly backed through the pasture gate towards the sty. Woody walked alongside, joking with Craig and Gary. I stood on the rear bumper, yelling what I considered helpful backing up instructions to Jim. I waited for the Stooges Pastry Day celebration to commence, but there was none. As we got closer, I could see the Stooges still huddled in the corner of the sty, silently staring at me. I don't know whether it was the sideboards on the truck, or the fact that it was Saturday morning and not Thursday evening, or the strange voices and ominous presence of the Brown brothers in their rubberized bib overhauls and gloves, but I could tell the pigs absolutely knew some bad shit was going down. Each one screeched and put up a fight as they were gang wrestled out of the sty, got their front and rear feet tied together and shoved up the makeshift ramp into the truck. Their faces that day, the pain squealing and the sad whines they made as Jim drove, drove away, haunted me for weeks. In the morning, instead of getting dressed and running over to feed the Stooges, I would just lie in bed thinking about them, about my betrayal. I felt guilty and complicit. And then after school, coming home from the bus stop, I tried to ignore the empty sty as I walked by. And this became easier a few weeks later when the sty was buried in December snow and would stay that way till April. Margaret gave my mom one of the hams for Christmas dinner that year. And as Dad started carving that big steaming hunk of pig thigh, all I could do was wonder which stooges it was. I managed to take a small bite, but when no one was looking, I put the rest of my slab back on the platter. No one said anything when I did. Eating meat is easier when you don't know the animal's name and his favorite snack food. I've never really liked ham since. Over the next few years, the Morse's zeal for raising and slaughtering animals kind of waned. Too much work, and overall it cost almost as much as buying meat in a store. Their chickens kept producing enough eggs to sell to the neighbors for 50 cents a dozen, and they kept sheep and steers in the pasture, which they would wholesale off periodically in partnership with the Browns. But they never got pigs again. By seventh grade, I started riding my bike a few miles down the road to my friend's house on weekends. Woody was in high school, and instead of fighting, we just ignored each other until years later when we both discovered a mutual affinity for getting high. <laughs> I've had an on and off relationship with red meat my entire life. I gave it up completely in my 20s, but it crept back into my diet in my mid-40s. I have no problem with chickens since they're, they're essentially fish with feathers, <laughs> but I've never encountered a fellow mammal that didn't have some form of personality. Meat is okay when it appears prepared on a restaurant plate or when I, s when I select neatly packaged and mostly unidentifiable small portions in a supermarket. But I've trained myself over the years never to think about where it comes from, especially bacon. Thank you. That was Eber Lambert. Next up is Carrie.